Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep into the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Goldfein, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guy to Funk. My guest today is Rock and Roll Hall of Fame keyboardist and singer Chris Jasper, best known for his work with the legendary Isley Brothers. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a, a true honor. Yeah, pleasure to be on, on the show with you. Thank you. Before we dig in, let's recap some of Chris Jasper's impressive history. Back in the early 1970s, the Isley Brothers had already carved out quite a career for themselves as a vocal trio during the late 50s and 1960s. But a brand new era began when they added their younger brothers and brother-in-law as musicians. This new so-called three plus three configuration racked up a dozen gold and platinum selling albums from 1973 to 1983 as one was one of the biggest acts of that decade. As a teen growing up during that time, they certainly were a favorite of mine and I had all the albums in the late seventies as soon as they came out. Not only was their overall sound immediately identifiable, but they were very unique and being equally adapted hardcore funk, guitar-driven rock, and sensual ballads. In fact, their work in any of those categories ranks with the very best from anyone during that era. The key ingredients to that was lead vocalist Ronald Isley, who was masterful in both gritty and delicate contexts, Ernie Isley, a blistering guitar player and one of my all-time favorites, and the man we're speaking with today, the classically trained composer and arranger credited as being the architect of the Isley's 3 plus 3 sound. In 1992, Chris Jasper and the Isley Brothers were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and since 1987, Chris has released 14 solo albums. All right, so with that, Chris, you ready for some Q&A? Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. During that golden 3 plus 3 period, what was the general approach to heading into the studio? Would there be a lot of extra tracks? You know, how was it determined what would make the cut? And did any tracks kick around for a long time before they were released? Yeah, well, the 3 Plus 3 album, um, at that particular time, we had done some covers. We had some covers in mind that we wanted to do, but we also had some original material they wanted to do as well. And that's what that album consisted of. But um, we, we did a lot of rehearsing before uh, we went to record uh, that project. That project was different in a lot of ways. Um, one way it was different was that um, the three of us younger guys had a lot more influence on how the music would actually sound and how, how the arrangements would go. Um, another way was that this was the first time we were going to California to record an album. We had previously been recording in New York and this was a big difference. We were going to, uh, you know, uh, take some time out, go out to Cal LA, uh, go into the record plant and uh, record an album, not knowing, you know, it was a totally new experience, not knowing how it was going to turn out. So um, it was really a different experience for the group. However, we did do a lot of rehearsing before we went. So we knew what the songs we were going to do. We, we kind of knew our parts, you know, most of them anyway. Uh, there were some overdubs and things done too uh, that were fresh, you know, and new, but um, it was well rehearsed. So we kind of knew what the basic tracks were going to be like. So how, um, you know, how did you whittle down what you had, you know? Um, you know, how many things went by the wayside? How many tracks did you eventually get down to, to what we saw? Um, as far as the original songs, um, we knew those were good when we were rehearsing them. So we didn't, you know, we didn't have to take any out. You know, we just used, they were really good ideas. We really rehearsed them a, a lot. Um, there was some covers maybe that we didn't include, you know, um, but as far as the orig original material, we used the, the ones we came up with and we thought they were strong enough, uh, you know, to be on the album. 
And here's a look at that uh, cover from back then. Um, so how democratic were practices within the band in general, Chris? You know, what was the dynamic like between the younger, uh, uh, you know, group that came in and, and the older brothers? And, you know, can you describe some of the personalities and some of that dynamic that went on back then? Um, yeah, it was, um, I tell you, it was a different, I think, experience for the older members, you know, because um, up to up to that point, up to 73, um, they were kind of used to, you know, doing things a certain way, you know, um, and when we got involved, um, that changed, that changed the procedure uh, a bit. Uh, like I said, we started to be more involved in the creation of the music and the production of the music. We were the um, essential, the, the, the instrumental element of the group. You know, we, we took over more and more of the instrumentation. I start playing more parts on the keyboard, you know, synthesizers and all that. So um, I think it took them a while to adjust to that new uh, uh, component, you know, because uh, they had a band before. They had um, a band called the Midnight Movers, and they played on a lot of the records prior to uh, like 1972. You know, so they were used to you know having like a band leader and him you know him writing the horn parts and things like that and in recording in a certain manner. Uh, we changed that, you know, uh, in '73, and I guess it took them a while to adjust because uh, they took less part in the you know the production of the the, the music, you know, uh, but you know it was a it was a change that worked. So, you know, it, it was something hard to uh, argue with. Was it a little cliquish though? You know, you guys had played together, you know, when you were younger before joining them and they had done their own thing and, you know. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. It, uh, we, were the, we were called the Jasmine Trio before we joined them. And we were used to playing together a lot, you know, um, you know, just jamming sometimes, sometimes working on ideas together. Uh, we would do small concerts and things in the uh, New, New York, New Jersey area, you know, and sometimes the older guys will come, you know, but um, uh, we were set sort of the creative, you know, force, you know, in, in, in the group, and uh, in, in particular me and Ernie Isley. Uh, and um, that's like I said, it was, it was a formula, it was a, it was a, 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 a good chemistry that worked. And so, uh, it was like a hard thing to argue with, you know what I mean? You know, like when you come up with, you know, a song like uh, High Was In My Life or, you know, uh, Brown Eyed Girl or something like that, and, you know, it sounded the way it did. And, I mean, you know, you can't really argue too much with something that sounds good and and this has potential. So uh, that's, that was, I think that was the big adjustment. You know, we were, uh, like me, I was I was trained in music my whole life. And you know, it was kind of a natural thing to me to create and, and do that. But it's another thing if you're on the other side of that. <laughs> you know, if, 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 if I'm coming in and you know doing certain things, um, sometimes I, I think I think they felt you know like maybe uh, kind of excluded sometimes. You mm -hmm. know, but um, like I said, it was a, it was a, a, a chemistry that worked. And after a while, everybody kind of got used to it, and, you know. Was there ever, uh, or can you think of maybe some sort of uh, incident or turning point where <clears throat> you kind of really won them over, where they were like, wow, these guys really do have it? Yeah, I think it, I think it was um, really after the second album, um, Live It Up. If Live It Up was a... Uh, uh, another kind of departure too, um, you know, because three plus three, we had, you know, we had some things with heavy keyboard work in it, you know, on the on the three plus three album, but live it up was a another departure. Like that was that song was featured keyboard, you know, and um, it was the first single, 
And um, I think after that, you know, everybody, everybody, all six of us realized that, hey, there's really something special here. And um, uh, this is something we should stick with, you know, as, as a uh, kind of formula, <laughs> you know. And uh, I think it was after that second album, Live It Up. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, process in the studio. You know, considering Ernie came on and played drums also, which I understand he played, you know, previously uh, as well. I'm not sure, you know, when he got the guitar into the mix, but, um, you know, how did you do it from a process standpoint? You know, would he lay down the drum track and then you would do some keyboards and when would he bring in the guitar? And, and just talk to me a little bit about that studio process. Yeah, well, um, generally what would happen, uh, like, even with uh, 3 Plus 3, uh, that album, uh, Ernie didn't play drums on uh, those songs. But when he did, what we did was, uh, I would usually play some, some keyboard part, and sometimes Marvin would play a bass part along with it. And he'd lay down the drum track, you know, <laughs> with this, the three of us, you know, like with the Jasmine Trio, <laughs> you know, that's, that's how we would lay down our basic tracks. And we got a really good feel from there. You know, you generally, we knew where the song was going, uh, what our overdubs had to be done. Because like I said, we would try to rehearse as much as we could before we got into the studio, because that would cut down a lot of the, you know, cost, you know, like the studio time, you know, because, you know, time is money. So we wanted to be as rehearsed as we could. So, that's how we set down a lot of those tracks. Now, there, there were instances where there was only me and Ernie too, because the song would require a bass synthesizer part, you know, or I would play the bass actually on some of the parts too. So on those songs, I would play a keyboard part and Ernie would play a drum part. But the drum, would, drum track would usually go down first along with a keyboard part or a keyboard part and another a bass part when Marvin played the bass, you know. So uh, that's usually how it went. How did how did you decide, you know, when you would unleash Ernie? You know, what tracks and when did it fit? Uh, generally, it was on a song. Usually, that it was his original idea. <laughs> you know, um, you know that lady was a collaboration, but we also knew he was going to do a solo on that. Uh, Summer Breeze was a another arrangement, but we also knew there was going to be a solo on there in the, uh, at the end. You know what I mean? Uh, in rehearsal, you know what I mean? Um, a lot of those things came about through rehearsing. And um, if sometimes Ernie would have an original idea that was heavy guitar from the very beginning, and we knew, you know, that song was going to be, you know, heavy guitar. You know, he's going to have a solo, and so. Usually from rehearsal and the inception of the song. That's how we knew. I think part of what really made that sound so unique was just the way you married together the guitar and the keyboard and the bass. Because a lot of times, you know, you got to really listen and try to figure out where's the bass in and the keyboard pick up. And also mm -hmm. the way Ernie's very distinctive guitar sound was almost like an overdrive, you know, synthesizer type of effect in a lot of cases. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, and he he did use different effects sometimes on different songs. Um, he had a guy. Uh, his name is Roger Mayer. Uh, he's an English fellow, and uh, he made some special uh, sort of gadgets, you know, for Ernie sound effect gadgets that that he used to use in the studio and on stage too. And um, he got different effects and different sounds, you know that uh would maybe go for one song better than another you know he would switch back and forth you know uh, but he did have one kind of consistent setup uh that he would go from you know like he'd have a consistent uh distortion wah thing and then he would add something else sometimes you know to his basic setup so depending on the song mm -hmm. Talking more about your keyboard style, Chris, and your technique, you know, how would you categorize your, your talents and your inclination, um, you know, looking at composition and, and nuance versus lead and soloing playing? 
Well, um, I'm basically, and I've always have been uh, interested in composition, the compositional aspect of putting a song together, melody, chord structure, you know, hook, you know, uh, primary hook, secondary hook, melody, you know, uh, performance of it. The total package is what uh, I was always interested in. Uh, what is that product going to sound like when we're finished, <laughs> you know, or when I'm finished? Um, and that's my main concern. Uh, if a solo is involved, fine. <laughs> if a solo isn't involved, also fine. But it's got to be something that speaks to uh, the people, the listener. Uh, can, can I make a connection somehow? Because that's what music is all about to me, is making that connection between, you know, the creator and the person who's listening. And if, if I can make that connection, that's, you know, I, I, I believe I succeeded. And I know a lot of musicians uh, may be, you know, they, they might feel that, hey, man, let me, let me just, you know, play a solo on everything, you know. But uh, sometimes, you know, a, so, a solo is, is something I also feel does that too. Like that's another statement, you know, and that statement should be something that connects. And that's the best solos are the ones that connect. Mm -hmm. You know, a guy just ripping and running. I mean, you know, it's, it's like a run on sentence sometimes, you know what I mean? Or, um, you know, you know, you ever hear these fast talkers, you know, they can, they can speak, you know, a thousand words in like, uh, you know, five seconds, you know, but you don't know what they said. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You have no idea what they said. Like, yeah, that was fast. Uh, okay. But, you know, and like I said, and that's what I feel solo should, solo is just another statement. And, and do you make that connection with the listener? You know, is, 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 did you project what you meant to project? And, and I think that's what makes great solos from, you know, not so great solos. Sometimes you have to try to teach that to, you know, the guys that have the chops, right? And you have to. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, especially guys who play well, they always want to do stuff. They want to go, oh, well, let me, let me do another. Let me do another. One. Well, you, sometimes you got to say, wait a second. Because Ernie used to ask me all the time, you know, what do you think, Chris? After what I played, what do you think? <laughs> you know, and sometimes I tell him, I said, well, you know, that was good. You know, that was good. And then sometimes he wouldn't think he did anything, you know, great. And I would say, hell, you don't have to do anymore. That's it. You got it. You know what I mean? And um, uh, that's the difference in great solos. And like I said, solos is not so good. Is that that statement was made. And you can't, I, I always mention, you know, the song Layla. You know, I think everybody can remember that's what clap and play. And that was one of the best ones. You know, mm -hmm. because it's memorable and he made a connection. And that's, I think, uh, like when, like uh, when I, when I talk to my own, you know, band, you know, when I put a band together and that's what I tell the guys, make sure you make a connection. You know, this, all that <laughs> ripping and running is nice, but if you don't make a connection, you, I don't think you've succeeded in, in what you were trying. It's a balance, right? Yeah. Right. So back in the, you know, the early mid seventies, how much creative freedom were you and the other guys in the band afforded? You know, did the label weigh in on the types of songs and, and single choices and that kind of thing? And did they ever try to, you know, match you up with an outside producer? Um, generally they just let us, kind of after after uh, three plus three album right they kind of just let us you know do our thing you know it, it wasn't too much uh involvement from the from uh, cbs uh because that album was so successful uh we were we, we were given that leeway to produce you know that those albums uh it was in the agreement so they just let us go. That was very successful. And then Live It Up came up. And um, 
that's the only time uh, they kind of say overruled uh, what, you know our decision as as far as the release. I remember coming back from uh, L.A. after we did that album, and we we played it, but we had a, a small listening session in in, in the executive office uh, offices, and. I think Ronald and, and the older guys were thinking Midnight Sky would be the first single. Mm -hmm. And um, we played it for them. And then a few of the A&R people came in and they said, you know what, guys, you know, live it up. That's that's the hit. That's the one, you know, that's the one we should go with. And um, but that's the first time uh, that, you know, they kind of, you know, overruled what the group was thinking. But I'm glad they did because that was the right choice. So did that um, when they did that? Did that also affect the sequencing of the album, or had you always planned on that? Uh, it didn't affect the sequence. No, we had already, you know, everything was still in the same sequence. But it's just "Live It Up" was the first uh, single released from that album. That's that's the only difference. And then they had a big, you know, twelve inch. They were doing twelve inches back then, so they did twelve inch, and it was big in the clubs, and it and it took the group into another uh, uh, area that we weren't, we, you know, we weren't being played a lot in clubs, you know? So it took us into a, a, another market, you know? It kind of expanded on, uh, you know, what three plus three did, you know? Well, so you had that freedom, which was great because I think it was, you know, so key yeah. to, you know, creating that sound and, and keeping it rolling and letting you guys fully uh, pursue that. So, you know, that said, though, and Live It Up being a hit as it was, to what extent did the band feel pressure to, to produce or generate hits as opposed to, you know, just the music and the albums? Well, that's true. Well, the, the more success you have, uh, the more you think about that. You know, the more you think about, well, uh, how, how good is the next project going to be? Uh, how, you know, how good are the next ideas? You know, you kind of set a level for yourself. And... Um, that bar, you always want to reach that bar. And then, you know, if you can't exceed it, you know. So we were conscious of that, you know, when we did the next album, The Heat Is On. Um, and it just so happens that, <laughs> you know, ideas start flowing, you know, from like Fight the Power, you know, For the Love of You, you know, uh, Fast Little, the Slow Side, The Heat Is On, the title track. Um, and that's, you know, I got some new toys for myself with the keyboards, you know, <laughs> um, which turned into like kind of a, a, a signature sound for me with funk, you know, that Neutron uh, 3 effect. And um, that was really kind of set the group into even another category because we had a top 40 pop hit with Fight the Power and mm -hmm. a number one album, you know, on, on the pop chart. And um, that really established us as a self-contained, you know, self-contained band and um, even broadened our audience even more. And that album right there? Yeah, that's the one. Song. Yeah. Um, I tell you, you know, there's certain songs, well, there are a lot in the Isaacs catalog. I mean, you know, no matter how many times I hear them, I can never hear too much. And, um, you know, Fight the Power is definitely one of those. Um, so in that, Chris, you know, you, you got this great sound and it's so identifiable and it's hidden like crazy. Um, is there the danger or the uh, temptation or do you think you kind of fell into it a little bit to get formulaic in any kind of way? How do you still keep it fresh? Uh I think by tr just being honest, you know, um, I, I learned that along, you know, like when I first started to study in composition um, and uh, I never forget my, my professor said to me, he said, you know, the most important tool a composer can have is his eraser, you know, um, and that, that is, that means that, you know, you always change, you want to change things to make it better. Don't, you, you, you don't get locked into anything just because you wrote it. You know what I mean? Uh, be willing to, you know, go over it, examine it, make it better, 
you know. And I and I always remember that, and I always try to do that with my material, you know. And and uh, I think that's how you stay fresh is stay honest, stay honest with what you've created. Is this is this really good? <laughs> you know, is it, or are you just like to hear yourself play, mm -hmm. or like to hear yourself sing? Is that it, or do you really have a good idea? You know, and that honesty, I think will keep you on the track to, you know, you may not have, every hit may not be as big as, you know, the other one, the previous one, or the one that's in the future, but you'll, you'll, you'll you usually will maintain some kind of consistency. And, and, and I have to bring up like, uh, like Motown, for example, they had a consistency, you know, and, and it was because, uh, you know, Barry Gordy and, and the rest of the people there, wanted that honesty. <laughs> they said, hey, you know, they used to hold meetings, executive meetings about releases and say, okay, what do we got here? You know, <laughs> what do we really have? You know, in Philly, they had Philly International, consistency. And, and I think when you have that honesty as far as what your music really is, I think you're more likely to be more consistent than someone else who isn't, may not be that honest, you know. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a bit about the, uh, the band's image uh, back then. You know, we've got very flamboyant uh, uh, attire and, uh, you know, pretty much graced all of those albums back then. And talk to me a little bit about how that uh, developed and, and where that came from and, and what type of, you know, image you were trying to get out there. Uh, I don't know if we had a specific one, uh, but we just wanted to try to keep up with, I guess, what a lot of other bands were doing, you know. I mean, the outfits back then were always a lot, a lot of flash, a lot of, you know, uh, either rhinestones or, you know, something shiny. <laughs> Everybody was wearing something shiny. <laughs> so, you know, we were just trying to keep up sometimes. And, um, but we didn't have any kind of real, like, image. We wanted to look what we thought was cool, you know. But um, it, that changed from time to time. Like, we started off with 3 plus 3 was like kind of leather and kind of velvet stuff and then live it up, continue with leather, you know, and then the heat is on changed a bit. And then it really changed after that, after uh, like harvest with the world. And uh, I think the next one, the go for your guns, uh, it started to go into the more kind of Broadway kind of look, you know, cause our des the guy who designed the outfits was designing Broadway shows. Mm -hmm. So it kind of went into that direction, you know, you know, I almost, I kind of wore like something that looked like a trapeze artist or something, you know, you know, it was like, it changed into like the show thing, you know, the stage, uh, Broadway thing. So, um, but we just tried to, you know, have something that kind of looked like what everybody else was kind of doing. Um, but in another way, uh, was kind of like our personal identity, you know what I mean? Like, you know, um, I would wear stuff different than some of the other members of the group, you know, because I, I used to work out, you know, you know, physical fitness and, you know, the bodybuilding and all that kind of stuff. So my stuff was more kind of revealing for, for my physique than maybe some other person in the group. They wear something different. But we would always want it to be something uh, that would look good on stage you know, our album cover. We said, if it looks good, if it would look good on stage, it'd probably look good on the album cover. You know? And I guess if there's any like image, that was it to create a stage kind of image, you know? If I would have caught the band in the studio uh, during those years, you know, how might have they been dressed? Oh, it's just kind of like I am, you know, like, you know, sweatsuit, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, jeans, you know, something comfortable. Because, you know, it's been a lot of hours in the studio, you know, it's like, you, you can't be like uncomfortable and, and spend like 24 hours recording, you know, we, we do that sometime, you know, round the clock. Yeah. Stepping back just a moment, Chris, to the transition from, you know, uh, you know, before your time with the band and to uh, this, you know, great 70s period, you know, how many, uh, you know, what percentage of the audience would you say were old fans that had come along versus new fans that had been gained? 
Now, now, say that again. Looking at the audience of the band, the Isley Brothers, mm -hmm. you know, how much at that time do you think was, you know, uh, old fans from the 60s that had come along for the ride into the yeah. 70s versus gaining the, a new audience? Um, I think from, wow, from 73, we picked up a lot of new people, a lot of new uh, people who may not have been, say, like Isaac Brothers fans before. Um, that 73, 83 period, picked up a whole lot more people. Um, and it, it was re reminiscent in our tours. You know, that, that was a big indicator. You know, before that, you know, Isaac Brothers, we would play like uh, the Bitter Inn, uh, Beacon Theater, you know, small, small venues. After three plus three, the venues got larger and larger, you know, and, into Madison Square Garden, 20,000. You know, cedar. Um, so yeah, after after the success of those albums, and it started in '73, it had to creep like eighty percent. You know, the, the increase in, in, in the amount of uh, that our audience increased because we weren't I, we were playing on the road before three plus three. We were playing with the band before that. People just hadn't seen us. <laughs> you know. But we were we would play on the records, you know, love the one you're with, and pop that thing and all that stuff. And we but we go on the road too, and we play clubs. We played a lot of clubs, you know, Phelps Lounge in Detroit, you know. Um, we played smaller venues, but after three plus three, you know, they started to gradually increase, increase, increase until these huge, you know, we we played you know Cobalt Arena and you know uh, in in, in uh, Detroit. You know, the biggest, we were always at the biggest places, you know, the, the whole, you know, 12,000 and above, you know. So um, I remember there was a time we were coming in and out of town, you know, Elvis would come in town, you know, he would leave and then we would come in and play the same venue, you know what I mean? And it was like, um, it was a whole nother thing after the success of the 70s. Good. Good. I would, I would love to have seen uh, the band in a, in a small club at that time. That would have been pretty mind-blowing. Oh, man. It's like, yeah, we, we played some small places, yeah. Bitter End was the smallest, I think. 